Okay, uh, dear learners uh, and dear friends, uh, welcome to this session. You know, today we have with us uh, uh, Mr. Bhuvan Chopra. He is one of our scholar in our school and uh, in the School of Interdisciplinary Transdisciplinary Studies. Uh, so he's, uh, he is uh, one of the proactive resources of our school and he did his master uh, in environment science from uh, University of Delhi. And you know, uh, he is also teaching at, uh, before he joined as a scholar here, different colleges in uh, University of Delhi. Uh, with this brief introduction, uh, I, uh, I would like to uh, say that uh, since he is our research scholar working in the field of sustainability science uh, as a part of his uh, research, uh, oh, I feel that uh, he should share uh, his uh, experience in this field or more of uh, he should learn something from our PhD students, PhD, uh, uh, the PGDSS students and the master student. That is one of the reasons why uh, we invite him uh, to give uh, uh, this uh, session, uh, to take this session on concept of biodiversity, types, distribution, interaction. So now hand over to you, uh, Ruben. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, students. And today we'll be discussing on uh, the concepts of biodiversity, uh, types, distribution, and utilization. As we all know that biodiversity forms the part and parcel uh, of our day-to-day -day life and also of the environment. The environment, uh, if we talk about as a whole or the ecosystem, as uh, you might have learned in your previous lectures, the biodiversity basically lies at the core of uh, the ecosystems and the various processes and the services which we derive from them. So today uh, we will discuss in brief, uh, what are uh, what is the biodiversity? What are the types of biodiversity? how the bio biodiversity has evolved, what is the distribution of the biodiversity all around the world and especially in India, the concepts or concept of the mega diverse nations and also uh, the biodiversity hotspots, why India is a mega diverse nation, we will also learn about that, what are endemic species, and uh, what are the en uh, endemic species which are present in India, Besides this, we will learn about what are the uses of the biodiversity, what are the ecosystem services uh, linked with the biodiversity and uh, the types of ecosystem services and how they play an integral role in sustainability science. So let's start with today's lecture. And uh, the first thing we might uh, know about is that what is biodiversity? So uh, basically the term biodiversity is a contraction of two words that is biological and second is diversity. And for the first time, this term biological diversity was used by Arthur Harris in his article, The Variable Desert. Uh, if we talk about uh, the contraction term that is biodiversity, it was coined by Walter G. Rosen. In very simple terms, biodiversity means the variety and the variability of the various life forms which are present on the earth, along with the diversity of ecosystems in which they thrive. So what is the variety? Variety here refers to the various kinds of species which are present on the earth. So, uh, you know, there are many estimates of scientists. Uh, some says there are around 3 million species. Some says around 100 million species. So uh, there are many estimates uh, which have been made uh, regarding the number of species which are present on the Earth. Second is the variability. If we see about uh, within the species, there is so many variations which we encounter. If we talk about uh, humans, uh, homo sapiens, you can see that uh, uh, there might be so many different features of different human beings and uh, which variate with the geographical uh, regions. For example, people in Africa might look very different from people living in China, or you can say the people which are living in Europe. 
are different from those living in India. So uh, this is basically because of the variability uh, and which is the resultant of the various kinds of genes which are present in the life forms. So uh, biodiversity concept encompasses the plants, animals, microorganisms, and it also encompasses uh, the domesticated biodiversity also, which we talk about the plant, uh, the domesticated plants such as cereals, such as uh, the horticultural crops, such as the domesticated animals. Uh, the biodiversity also encompasses that. If we talk about uh, the estimate of the species, which I talked initially, uh, the rough estimate in today's time is eight to 12 million species are present on the earth. And now the latest figure, which has come out uh, and predicted by the scientists, it is around 8.7 million species are present on the earth. So this is basically a brief uh, con introduction to the concept of the biodiversity. Next, we move on, and on this diagram, you can very clearly observe uh, what I am referring to uh, about the variety and the variability here. The variety, you can see the various kinds of species which are present on the earth. We have the uh, seahorse, we have the butterflies, the sparrow, then we have the shark, the sea turtle, and the sunflower. Similarly, uh, if we talk about what is variability, so uh, variety means the species and the variability you can see the various uh, breeds of dogs are present. Okay, and similarly, the various breeds of cattle can be observed. So this, this, is, uh, the, this is basically indicating the variability or variations which are present within the population of a species. Now, uh, let's talk about what the types or three levels of the biodiversity. Here we can see there are uh, three levels of the biodiversity. First one is the ecosystem diversity. Uh, we can say that not many ecosystems are there which are present on the earth. They can be as small as a very small pond or they can be uh, as large as large oceans. Okay, And within that, we can observe large number or variations which are present in, uh, in these ecosystems. Uh, within the ecosystems, we have we can find lot many species, which can be uh, plants, animals, microorganisms, uh, which include fungi or bacteria. Uh, so that is basically the species diversity. And then within that, uh, the populations of various organisms, we can observe the genetic diversity, uh, which is uh, because of the variations which are present in the genes or the DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid. Okay, so uh, this diagram is clear indicative of that. Now here we can imagine, but how the species are very different from each other. This is a picture of Serengeti in East Africa. And here we can see that uh, lion is there, the elephants, the zebra and uh, wild cape buffaloes along with Thompson gazelle. So you can see the, uh, how the different species, they are coexisting with each other within an ecosystem that is the savanna grassland ecosystem and uh, how uh, different species they have co-evolved with each other so this basically diagram is integrated oh, the picture is integrate uh, indicating that so uh, when we talk about the species diversity first of all let us uh, know what is species basically it is a basic unit of classification uh, if we know about the biological classification, the basic unit of that is the species. And uh, within uh, how we can classify the species, it is defined as a group of organism that can mate with each other and produce fertile offsprings. So the members of the species, uh, they don't have reproductive isolation. Uh, that is the basic criteria through which we can uh, differentiate between the various species. Okay, so uh, if you can say the lion and the tiger uh, in natural conditions, uh, they are reproductively isolated, so can't, they can't interbreed with each other. However, we can see in the zoo and uh, uh, because of the artificial means, uh, the, the species, they can be uh, reproduced artificially. Uh, 
for example liger and uh, is basically uh, you can say uh, reproductive uh, it is a result of reproduction between the lion and the tiger so uh, that is i'm not referring to that but basically in the nature we can uh, observe that reproductive isolation is there uh, between uh, various species they can't mate with each other and produce fertile offsprings so that is uh, the basic difference between the two species how we can differentiate between the species <clears throat> and the formation of new species uh, how the new species they arose uh, from the existing species this whole process is known as speciation sometimes because of the geographical isolation or because of other uh, things sometimes uh, some barriers they are created between uh, the population of the same species which result in the process of speciation the new species arising from the old species similar thing we can see in africa uh, <clears throat> where uh, sometimes uh, chimpanzees and bonobos they can be observed uh, where the congo river uh, changed its course and the population of chimpanzees uh, they are separated from each other because of the flow of the river congo and now uh, the two species uh, have evolved from the chimpanzees the other species which has evolved is now known as the bonobos the bonobos uh, might look like chimpanzees but they are uh, you can say the they have less aggression as compared to chimpanzees so this has been also observed in nature and how this process is continuous and various kinds of species they are evolved in this way now uh, there are two more terminologies which we have to learn here what is uh, uh, one is the species richness and that is basically the indicator of the variety of those number of different kind of species which are present within the ecosystem that includes the genera and the families also how many families or genera which are present in the ecosystem this is basically an indicator of that then we have the species abundance or evenness the species abundance gives us account of the relative abundance of species which species are more abundant uh, as compared to other and uh, evenness uh, basically gives us a concept that how evenly the species is distributed within the ecosystem <clears throat> in the next slide we can sorry in the next slide uh, we can learn about there are some indices uh, through which we can deduce that how many species they are present in the ecosystem and what are the what is the diversity which is linked with it so uh, there are two indices which we will discuss here fun is the shannon wiener index uh, uh, which range from 0 to 5 uh, and is basically uh, the count of the evenness of the species and how evenly a species is distributed shannon wiener index uh, generally basically tells us that and the formula which is adopted for calculating the shannon wiener index uh, you can see the summation sign and uh, ni which is indicated the number of individuals of the e species and i means the ith number of the species and uh, n means the total number of individuals or amount for the site and in uh, basically is indicating the natural integration or natural log of the number okay uh, next is the species diversity another index which is linked with it and uh, that is known as a species species uh, simpson index the simpson index basically is a measure of the dominance how predominant is the species uh, so uh, if we talk about it gives the probability that any two individuals drawn at random and infinitely large community belong to different species so bas basic principle which is in involved in it is this so lambda uh, is uh, the sign for the simpson index and uh, it is basically the uh, you can say the summation sign you can also see in the formula and uh, ni means the number of individuals or amount of each species and n is equal to the total number of the species which are present in the site so basically simpson index represents the abundance or the dominance how predominant a species is within the ecosystem uh, basically the simpson index give you that idea 
Next is the second type of diversity, which we can observe, and that is uh, the genetic diversity. So here you can see that there are various kinds of bananas are there and different kinds of um, varieties of mangoes, which we can commonly observe in Indian markets. Uh, for example, Alfonso, Totapari, Langra, Kesar, uh, Vanraj, Chausa. So there are n number of uh, you can say the varieties of the mangoes and uh, the bananas and they are all resultant of uh, the genetic diversity which is present in the banana that is musa parisiaca and uh, the mango that is mangifera indica although the species is one but there are so many variations that we get various kinds of varieties of these fruits available in the market uh, so here is the, uh, uh, the genetic diversity, we can observe that because of the variation in the genetic makeup of each individual, as you can even see uh, that you might look very different from your friend, uh, but you look very sim something similar to your family members. This is all because of the genes they are playing but there are large number of combinations of genes are present uh, and they, that gives the various uh, specific characters to that individual so many individuals uh, they look very different from each other for example if you talk about uh, similar looking individuals uh, like in tiger suppose uh, sometimes students they have confusion like how to distinguish between the tigers so uh, even in tigers, you can see various kinds of variations that are there. The stripe patterns of two tigers are never same to each other. They are never alike. So uh, as we have the fingerprints, the similarly in tigers, we have the stripe pattern through which we can distinguish between uh, the two tigers. So uh, that is because of the various kinds of genes which are present in the population. Uh, if you talk about the rice, there are many, around 40,000 varieties of rice around the world. If you can say in India also, you can observe that uh, we have Basmati, Sela, these are some of the uh, varieties of the uh, rice. If you talk about the world, there are around 340 breeds of the dogs alone. So we have the golden retriever, we have the chihuahua and uh, pit bulls. These are various kinds of breeds of dogs which are present around the world. And next, we have to talk about the ecosystem diversity. The species uh, which thrive in the ecosystems, these ecosystems are also diverse from each other. For example, if we talk about the forests, forest ecosystems, there are uh, basically uh, the major types if you talk about. We have uh, the tropical forest, uh, also known as the rainforest or the evergreen forest. So evergreen forest or the uh, rainforest, they are further divided into temperate evergreen forest and the tropical evergreen forest. Then we have the deciduous forest, which are further divided into uh, the tropical and the temperate deciduous forest. Uh, if you talk about your uh, uh, mangrove forest, uh, then we have the coniferous forest, we have the thorn forest. What are these? These are basically the indicative of various kinds of forests which are present on the earth. Uh, even in India also, we have 16 forest types which are present uh, and subtypes also. They, they have, uh, I'm talking about the types now, even subtypes also exist within the forest. So uh, this is basically indicating that uh, within the ecosystems, we can observe various kinds of uh, variations. And that is indicative of the ecosystem diversity. Okay. And uh, uh, if we talk about the grasslands, another terrestrial ecosystem. So here also we have the tropical grasslands and within the tropical grasslands, we have so many examples. For example, savanna grassland, which is an example of the tropical grassland. Uh, in India also, we get uh, various kinds of grasslands which are present here, for example, semi-arid grasslands of the Northwest India. And then we have uh, the, uh, the uh, Terai grasslands, Shola grasslands are present in the Western Ghats. Uh, so these are the variations of grasslands we observe in India, Indian context. Uh, similarly, we talk about the deserts. We have the hot deserts and the cold desert. The hot deserts, uh, basically, you can observe uh, where the 
summers are really very harsh and the temperature goes beyond 50 degrees centigrade or more and examples include your sahara desert and in india we have the thar desert similarly uh, if you talk about uh, your uh, cold desert uh, in cold desert the winters are very harsh the temperature might go beyond minus 50 degrees centigrade so here you uh, in uh, india we have the ladakh play ladakh and spiti uh, region the lahol spiti region of the himachal pradesh they are all examples of the cold desert gobi desert which is in mongolia and the northern china uh, that is the large uh, that is also example of the cold desert so we can observe that various kinds of ecosystems are present on the earth uh, similar variation we can see even in aquatic ecosystems uh, even in uh, the tropical and the temperate ocean waters or sea waters we can see variations are there coral reefs they are present only in uh, tropical hot waters warm waters so here is basically uh, what is ecosystem diversity so uh, that can that encompasses basically the terrestrial ecosystems and also the aquatic ecosystems uh, the variation between them uh, within them so that is indicative of the ecosystem diversity forests deserts grasslands ponds river lakes ocean seas estuaries these are all examples uh, of the ecosystem diversity uh, the variations within the ecosystems. Now we will talk about the three perspectives of ecosystem diversity. The first one is the alpha diversity and alpha diversity basically indicate that how much species diversity is present at the habitat uh, level or the local level. Next is the gamma diversity which uh, basically uh, encompasses the total species diversity which is present within the very large landscape. If we uh, consider a large landscape, within that we can observe that so many uh, species diversity can be observed in it. So that is indicated by the gamma diversity. Then we have the beta diversity which is uh, the ratio between the gamma diversity and the alpha diversity. That means uh, diversity which we observe at the regional level and the local level. So uh, you can uh, compute uh, the beta diversity by taking the ratio between the gamma diversity and the alpha diversity. Now next is the evolution of the biodiversity and how the biodiversity has evolved. Uh, if we talk about the evolutionary history of the biodiversities in efforts of the 4 billion years of evolution, that is quite a long time. So until about 600 million years ago, we have only single celled organisms which are present in the oceans and the seas. Uh, but after that, uh, the metazones of the multicellular organisms, they arose from them and they formed large colonies in water. And uh, uh, after the slow evolution, uh, you can see that the primitive fishes and vertebrates, they also arose and land plants and uh, they also uh, started arising. So around 500 million years ago, there was a burst in speciation, which lead to evolution, first of the primitive fishes and the vertebrates. And also along with them, around 440 million ago, years ago, the plants started colonizing the land. The plants started colonizing the land. They start coming on the land and land plants, they become very common. You all must be knowing about uh, the bryophytes and the pterodophytes. Pterodophytes and the bryophytes, they, they have amphibious life cycle. And from pterodophytes, uh, the, the gymnosperms have evolved. And from gymnosperms, we have the angiosperms, which are the higher plants, uh, which have evolved. So this is a very interesting journey that how plants, uh, they have started colonizing the earth. So 440 million years back, they have started doing this. They have evolved the uh, cellular structure, uh, the giant structures, uh, which uh, help them to survive in the harsh environment of the terrestrial uh, ecosystem where they are exposed directly to sunlight and they have evolved the extensive root system to absorb uh, the water from the soil. Uh, if we talk about the animals, here also you can say uh, the first vertebrates, they were basically the primitive fishes from which large number of fishes they arose. And after that uh, came the amphibians. Amphibians, basically, they can survive both in water and the land. And uh, 
next to them came the reptiles which have hard eggshells and they can lay their eggs in uh, the dry conditions uh, so uh, came the reptiles and right after that the birds and the mammals which are the higher living organisms also involved. So you might have a, uh, are aware of the dinosaurs which are now extinct from the face of the earth. So uh, this is basically the brief account of the evolution of the biodiversity and around 200 million years ago the plate tectonics led to the steep rise in biodiversity which has been observed on the earth. Uh, even uh, there are some episodes of mass extinction which have occurred uh, alongside with these evolutionary episodes of the biodiversity. <clears throat> so next we talk about the, that how the biodiversity um, of the world is distributed. So if we talk about uh, all across the world, we uh, look at the scenario, the trop if we talk about the terrestrial ecosystems, Terrestrial ecosystems, uh, we observe that uh, near to equator and the tropical regions, they harbor more biodiversity as compared to temperate uh, regions and the polar regions. The reason behind this is uh, in tropical regions, uh, the organisms, they don't have to adapt uh, to the harsh conditions because the temperature is high all throughout the uh, year and also there is abundance of rainfall. So that's why they don't have to evolve special kinds of structure to adapt to the, the harsh conditions. If, if you look at the temperate regions and also in polar region, there need to be a specialized structure for organisms to adore, adapt to the harsh climate. In the temperate regions, we can observe the four seasons as there and along with that, there is snowfall during the winter months. Uh, so we can observe less biodiversity as compared to tropical regions in the temperate regions in your uh, if we talk about in terms of the terrestrial biodiversity and the least biodiversity can be observed in the observed in the tundra region okay uh, if we talk about the water uh, or the aquatic ecosystems uh, here you can find in tropical waters, uh, there is an uh, ecosystem called coral reefs, which are very uh, uh, diverse in nature. And they are formed by the corals, which are the unicellular organisms and uh, uh, the uh, sealant traits, basic, uh, sorry, uh, basically they are present in water and they form the extensive colonies there in which large number of fishes, uh, they can uh, be found here and uh, your uh, coral reefs they can be referred as the rainforest of the oceans okay now we uh, come to that what are the trends which are observed at the species level uh, in, across the world uh, if you know about the known species of the organism the largest number of species which are observed is within the animals next comes the plants followed by the fungi and the per protist and finally the u bacteria if we talk about in within the animals, the maximum number of species which can be observed is of insects. Okay, so insects have the largest diversity of, of uh, 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 within the various animal groups. Okay, the, if, if we talk about the kingdom Animalia, so uh, various kinds of uh, uh, phylums they are there. So within them, uh, if we talk about the species diversity, the uh, maximum diversity can be find in the insects uh, followed them by uh, you can say the arachnids the crustaceans the echinoderms uh, mollusks uh, even your flat forms rot rotifers cnidarians they also have diversity but as compared to the insect diversity it is very less uh, if we talk about the vertebrates, uh, so total uh, vertebrate species which are present on the earth is around 58,498 species uh, and out of that uh, maximum number of species is within the fishes followed by amphibians, the reptilians and also the birds have also had the high diversity. Uh, then we have the mammals. So if we talk about the plants, uh, the flowering plants or the dicots. Uh, 
we know that uh, angiosperms are there, which are known as the flowering plants. And uh, within the flowering plants, we have the monocots and the dicots. Monocots means the single cotyledons, and the dicot means uh, there are two cotyledons which are present there. So uh, within the angiosperms, the dicots have uh, the more diversity as compared to your uh, uh, monocots and uh, then we have the conifers uh, followed by ferns and the mosses uh, in terms of diversity which we can observe in the plant kingdom next we come to the concept of the mega diverse nation okay so there is an uh, center which is known as the world conservation monitoring center and it has recognized that 17 mega diverse nations or countries that are present on the face of earth that harbor more than 70 percent of the recorded species which are present on the earth so uh, this is basically the uh, nations which are harboring maximum amount of biodiversity within them uh, so such nations they are termed as the mega diverse nations and uh, if we talk about uh, there is another criteria for mega diverse nations that 5000 at least 5000 species of vascular plants must be endemic uh, to that nation then that uh, nation can be categorized as a mega diverse nation so there are uh, 17 mega diverse nations which can be observed on the earth that includes your Australia, Brazil, China, Colombia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ecuador, Indonesia, India, Madagascar, Malaysia, Mexico, Papua New Guinea, Peru, Philippines, or the Philippines, South Africa, United States, and the Venezuela. So these are uh, the nations with having maximum biodiversity, which is present within them. Next, we come to India as a mega diverse nation. Why India must be considered as a mega diverse nation? So, if we talk about the total land area of the India, we are having only 2.4% of the land area of the world. But at the same time, 7 to 8% of the recorded species of the world they are present in India. And mind you, this number is continue and this percentage is continuously increasing. Okay, so in, in, uh, there are a lot many species which are yet to be discovered. Okay, uh, if we talk about uh, uh, at present around 8.7 million species, uh, they have been predicted by the scientists and out of that only 1.7 million species they are known to the scientific community. They have been discovered, they have class been classified uh, by the scientists and uh, roughly you can say around 6 million more than 6 million species are yet to be discovered and classified they are not known to the scientific world okay so uh, this number of recorded species is continuously changing and even in context of india and especially if you go to western ghats and northeast india uh, you can find lot many uh, uh, diversity there and uh, Every, almost every year uh, scientists they are going there and discovering various kinds of new species whether it was of amphibians or fishes and even of plants and mammalian species so uh, how, what is the main region re uh, reason behind india having such a rich uh, biodiversity the main reason behind is the topographical features of india uh, there is diversity within uh, the terrestrial and aquatic habitats which we can observe here in india we have 10 biogeographic regions which are present in our country and each of these 10 biogeographic regions have unique biodiversity within uh, of its own uh, so from name it is very clear bio means the living living organism geographic means the distribution uh, within uh, the earth or the geography we can talk about so we have uh, the, in india 10 biogeographic regions they have been identified and uh, we will also learn about what are these 10 biogeographic regions uh, or regions or zones uh, if we talk about the faunal biodiversity in india uh, we can see around 1,690 species of fauna, that means the animals which are present uh, in India, 
and 47,480 species of flora. That means the plants have been observed in our country. Uh, if we talk about the total uh, geography, uh, forest cover in India, we have 7,12,249 square kilometers of India, which is present under the cover of forest. Now, from this diagram, uh, this picture, it will be very clear to you that what are these 10 geographical regions which are present in India. The first one is the Trans Himalayas, which is uh, indicated by the cyan blue color. And Trans Himalayas means beyond Himalayas. Trans means beyond. So we have the uh, Trans Himalayas here, uh, especially the region of Ladakh, Gilgit, Baltistan, and also the Lahore and Spiti region of uh, the Himachal Pradesh can be classified into it. And uh, here you can say it is an example of the cold desert. The cold desert-like condition uh, are prevalent in this region, and uh, not many biodiversity is linked with it. Although uh, you can't find lot many floral diversity as compared to large plant groups like trees, they are not so much abundant. But herbaceous plants, they are very much abundant here. And hello, if if we talk about. Uh, next biogeographical region and that is himalayas so himalayas basically include your uh, the western himalayas the central himalayas the western himalayas include your region of uh, himachal pradesh uttarakhand and jammu and kashmir uh, the central himalayas basically for some parts of uh, uttarakhand and nepal and then we have the sikkim region and then we have the eastern himalayas uh, which uh, includes your arunachal pradesh region so himalayan region uh, is is also encompassed within the, uh, the 10 biogeographic region of the India. Uh, the next one is your, uh, if we talk about the plains, we have the Indo Gangetic Plain region. So, Indo Gangetic Plains, we have uh, the upper Indo Gangetic Plains, which includes the parts of uh, Uttar Pradesh and some parts of Bihar, and then the lower Indo Gangetic Plains, uh, which includes your uh, Bihar and West Bengal region. If we talk about uh, uh, the Punjab, Haryana, and parts of uh, Western UP, Western Madhya Pradesh, uh, Rajasthan, uh, and Gujarat, they some parts of these regions they can be classified under the semi-arid region, the semi-arid region which encompasses uh, the thorn forest and also the grasslands. Uh, natural green grasslands can be seen here. Uh, if we talk about the desert region of India, uh, we have uh, parts of Western Rajasthan uh, and also run of Kutch region, which is included in uh, this biogeographic uh, zone. And uh, then we have uh, the Deccan Peninsula or the Deccan Plateau. Uh, so that basically includes the parts of Jharkhand, Chota Nagpur Plateau. And then we have the Odisha, the Chhattisgarh, the Eastern Madhya Pradesh, uh, major part of Maharashtra, uh, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, and Tamil Nadu can be included under the Deccan Peninsula biogeographic region. Uh, then we have the Western Ghats. In the Western Ghats, we have uh, the parts uh, of your, uh, the Western parts, especially of Maharashtra, Southern Gujarat. And then we have the Goa, which is entirely under the Western Ghats. And similarly, Western parts of Kerala and Karnataka, they are also included in this. Uh, we have uh, the very vast coastline. If you talk about India, we have around more than 7,000 kilometers of the coastal region, which is present there, harboring large number of uh, uh, marine fishes. And uh, uh, you can say various kinds of aquatic uh, organisms can be observed here. If we talk about islands, we have uh, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and uh, along with Lakshadweep Islands, which can be observed here. Uh, the last biogeographic region which is present in India is uh, the Northeast uh, region. And here we have the states of Assam, Manipur, Mizoram, Tripura, Nagaland, and Meghale, which are included in that. So here is a brief account of the uh, overview of the flora and the flora faunal diversity which is present in India in context with the uh, overall diversity which is present around the world. So here you can see that uh, if we talk about in terms of flora, all uh, 
it, it is representing the Indian flora is representing 11.2% of the total floral species which are recorded all around the world. And uh, this number uh, has increased from 43,830 in 2014 to 47,485 in 2018. And this is, mind you, 11.2% of the total uh, diversity of the world. Similarly, in fauna, we can observe that uh, the number of species of uh, fauna is 1,167, 1, 1, which is 6.7% of the whole world. Now, this uh, uh, table is basically indicating that uh, what are the floral species, number of them which are present in India, and what is the, their endemism. Uh, endemic species are those species which are only found in a particular region and nowhere else in the world. Such species are known as endemic species. In context of India, we have, if we talk about the uh, flowering plants, uh, angiosperms, if we talk about, there are 18,666 species which are recorded in India. Out of that, 4,303 species are endemic here. If we talk about uh, the non flowering plants, we have the bryophytes, uh, in which 2,780 species are recorded here in the country, out of which 629 species are endemic. If we talk about gymnosperms, 82 species are present in India, and out of that, 12 species are endemic. Similar context we can see in bryophytes and pteridophytes. Uh, here you can observe that in bry bryophytes, we have around 1,302 species. And in, uh, sorry, in bryophytes, we have 2,780 species, and in pteridophytes, we have 1,302 species. Uh, in uh, if we talk about the fungi, that is also a very diverse group we can observe here in India. And out of that, 15,396 species are, uh, you can say, uh, they are present in India, out of which 4,100 species, they are endemic. So uh, this is the data up to 2019. And uh, if you observe that uh, past three years because of Corona, uh, there are less number of exploratory surveys which are carried out and might be when the new data will be available for 2021 and 22, we might have more uh, number of species which are added to this list. Next, we come to uh, the faunal diversity of India and uh, uh, what is the rate of endemism? How many number of species are endemic uh, as in uh, your floral diverse, faunal diversity, if we consider? So protozoans, if we talk about uh, the number of species is 3,545, out of which 640, they are endemic. Uh, if we talk about the chordates, uh, fishes, uh, they exhibit maximum diversity in India uh, and around 3,439 species they have been reported till about 2019 uh, in India and uh, for 82 species they are endemic here. In amphibians 427 species they are present uh, in the country out of which 287 they are endemic and mind you uh, especially the endemism of amphibians is very high in case of western ghats. Uh, we will also learn about that case. Uh, in reptilians, we talk about 641 species are recorded and 220 species are endemic. Birds, uh, another biodiverse group after fishes, we, here we have 1,343 species out of which 81 are endemic. And finally, the mammals, we have 429 species out of which 45 are recorded as endemic. Now, in another term, agricultural biodiversity, if we talk about that, uh, uh, India is also having large uh, number of agricultural biodiversity. And it is one of the 12 Webulolian centers of diversification of various cultivated plants. That means uh, many cultivated plants which we see today, their wild relatives have evolved uh, in India and they are, can still be observed in the wild. So uh, basically this region is also referred to as the Hindustan center of origin of crop plants. There are around 15 different agroclimatic zones which can be observed in the country. And uh, there is a first gene century which has been set up in India in the Garo Hills of Assam uh, for protection of the wild relatives of citrus plants. Mind you, many citrus plants uh, 
they have evolved in India. They can, uh, the wild relatives of these citrus plants can be observed uh, still in the wild in our country. Uh, center of a region of citrus plants basically lies in India, and some uh, they are also in, present in China also. Uh, also, you can say India is having large number of uh, breeds of domesticated animals such as cattle, buffalo, uh, sheep, goat, uh, even your donkeys and horses. Okay, so this is indicative of the agriculture biodiversity which is present in India. Next we come to that endemism in India. Um, as I discussed in my earlier uh, slide, uh, endemic species are those species which are found in a particular region and nowhere else in the world. So this is a basic definition uh, of what is endemic, what are endemic species. If we talk about the endemism uh, in India. The, uh, in India, if we talk about India stands at the 10th position in terms of birds. Uh, it has having 69 species which are endemic uh to the country and in case of reptiles india stands fifth with 156 species and in case of amphibians it lies it comes at the seventh position with 110 species if we talk about the overall uh endemism which is found in uh, the plant this is an endemic here and 28,537 species of fauna uh, that means the animals can be found here in the country. Next we come to the concept of the biodiversity hotspots and uh, the biodiversity hotspot this term knowledge is coined by the uh, scientists uh, known as Norman Myers in the year 1988. So uh, there are two strict uh, I will give you example that uh, why a region is known as the biodiversity hotspot. You might have internet hotspot in your home. As you go to, uh, near to the internet hotspot, uh, the signals or strength of the internet, it becomes very high. Similarly, in biodiversity hotspots, uh, we can see that they have a large amount of biodiversity. And at the same time, there is a great threat because of the anthropogenic activities uh, lingering over these areas. So. Uh, uh, there are two criteria through which we can classify the any any particular region in the world, uh, especially the terrestrial areas uh, in context of the biodiversity hotspot. The first criteria is that 1500 species of the vascular plants uh, must be endemic to that particular region. And second is only 30% of the original habitat must be intact of that region. That means 70% of uh, the native habitat has been destroyed by the anthropogenic activities. Uh, so these areas uh, land surface, but, but at the same time, they are harboring 43% uh, of the birds, mammal, reptilian, and amphibian species. Okay. Uh, if we talk about the whole world, we are having only 36 biodiversity which uh, hotspots which are present in the world and in context of india we will learn here that around four biodiversity hotspots can be observed in our country uh, what are the names of these four biodiversity hotspots so first one is the western ghats in the sri lanka and out of that the western ghats region that means the parts of uh, especially the western parts of kerala karnataka maharashtra southern southern gujarat and the goa uh, can be classified under the western ghat region and here we also observe uh, the shola grasslands and your uh, rainforests uh, uh, tropical rainforests can be observed here then we have the sundaland hotspot uh, which includes the part of your Thailand, Bruni, Malaysia, Indonesia, and uh, out of that, uh, Nicobar Islands. Mind you, not Andaman Islands, but Nicobar Islands of uh, India, they are part of Sundaland hotspot. Then we have the Indo Burma hotspot, in which in, uh, includes the parts of Assam and Meghalaya and some parts of other northeastern states. And uh, we have, finally, we have the Eastern Himalayan Biodiversity Hotspot, which includes uh, parts of uh, Eastern Himalayas in India, for example, your uh, Arunachal Pradesh, uh, Sikkim, they are present in it. And we have the Bhutan and Nepal, which are 
present in this biodiversity hotspot. So this is uh, this diagram is uh, this map basically is showing the distribution of the various biodiversity hotspots in our country. So here we have the Himalayan biodiversity hotspots, the northeastern region, uh, including the Indo Burma hotspot. Then we have the Sunda land, and finally the Western Ghats. Uh, now we come to what are uh, what is uh, the uh, main feature? What are the main features of the Eastern Himalayan hotspot? Here you can see that ten thousand species of plants uh, can be observed here, out of which three thousand one hundred sixty are endemic to this particular place, with seventy one genera, and nine eighty species of birds and three hundred mammalian species are also recorded here. If we talk about uh, the original extent of uh, this eastern Himalayas biodiversity hotspot. It is around seven lakh forty one thousand seven hundred six square kilometers, and out of which, uh, if we talk about the vegetation which is remaining, is one lakh eighty five thousand four hundred twenty seven square kilometers of original vegetation is now remaining. The endemic plant species, their number is very high, and it is around three thousand one hundred and sixty species which can be found here. Next, we move on towards the Indo Burma hotspot, which is spread in uh, the area of 23,000 lakh 73,000 uh, and 57 square kilometers. And uh, this region is supporting very high plant uh, species richness. So, around 7,000 endemic plant species are pre uh, present uh, out of 13,500 species, uh, accounting for 51.9 percent of endemism. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is also large number of endemism which can be observed in the number of amphibians and the freshwater fishes along with the reptiles in this biodiversity hotspot. If we talk about uh, the Western Ghats in the Sri Lanka, the stretch of the Western Ghats is around 1600 kilometers. And this area is especially known for its diversity in amphibians and the freshwater fishes. Uh, the, if we talk about uh, uh, amphibians, the number is uh, the percentage is sorry, 73 percent of uh, amphibian species are endemic to this place, uh, which are recorded nowhere else in the world. Uh, and if we talk about in number, around 130 and species of amphibians, they are endemic out of 178 total number of species. If we talk about freshwater fishes, 72.8 percent of the fresh uh, water fishes are endemic. Uh, out of 191 total species of freshwater fishes found here. Now, here are the two examples of uh, some mammalian species which are uh, endemic to Western Ghats. First one is the lion tail macaque, and uh, it should be named as the uh, uh, lion faced macaque because it has the mane like a lion. And uh, it is especially found in the Silent Valley uh, region in Kerala, uh, near Kunti Puja River. Uh, and uh, then we have the Nili Tahar is a kind of sheep which is observed in, uh, sorry, it's a kind of wild goat. Is a uh, kind of wild goat species which we observe in India. We have two tahar species. Uh, one, uh, first one is the Himalayan tahar, and the second one is the Nilgiri tahar. And this Nilgiri tahar uh, is, pre uh, is present in the Shola grasslands of the Western Ghats. Finally, we have the Sundaland hotspot and the Nicobar Islands uh, are part and parcel of the Sundaland Global Biodiversity Hotspot. It comprises only 0.25 percent. That is uh, only meager amount of India's total geographical area. But at the same time, it harbors 10 percent of the country's fauna species. So this is basically the uniqueness of this area. And uh, there is a high endemism as in terms of amphibians, your plants and freshwater fishes along with reptiles, which can be observed in this hotspot. Now we come to another important discussion regarding the importance of the biodiversity, how biodiversity plays an integral role in uh, ecosystem functioning. So uh, biodiversity underpins the delivery of various ecosystems 
benefits, uh, whether they are goods or the services which we derive from the ecosystems, uh, biodiversity plays an integral role in doling out these ecosystem functions. Uh, secondly, uh, biodiversity basically cushions us from the various stresses uh, which we observe uh, in the nature. And it's basically, basically an insurance against various kinds of diseases and the climate change, uh, which we are observing now. And uh, biodiversity basically provides us all kinds of tangible, that means the direct or perceptible benefits and even the intangible or non-perceptible, but uh, equally important benefits uh, for the human well-being. So nature has sustained uh, itself. It is in, you can say, uh, nature is uh, automatically sustaining itself uh, from millions and billions of years using solar energy, biodiversity, and nutrient cycling. So these are the various uh, three very important processes which are uh, linked with the sustainability of the nature. So here we come to the ecosystem services concept. And uh, there are various definitions which are available for uh, the, regarding the concept of the ecosystem services. Uh, one definition which has been given by Daly et al. in his research paper in 1997, this is the name of the scientist. Uh, he uh, has given that ecosystem services are the conditions and the processes through which the natural ecosystems and the species that make up make them up sustain and fulfill human life. So basically the human life is nourished by the ecosystems and its various processes. So the second definition, which is given by Robert Constanza in his uh, very iconic paper uh, published in the year 1997, uh, According to that, the ecosystem goods and services represents the benefit the human population derived uh, directly or indirectly from ecosystem functions. Uh, and the third definition, which I like to mention here, is uh, given by Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which occurred in the year 2005. And according to that, the ecosystem services are the benefit which people obtain from the ecosystems, both the tangible and non intangible. Okay, uh, if we talk about uh, in terms of monetary uh, in monetary terms that how much benefits uh, which uh, human beings they derive from the ecosystem, like, uh, according to Robert Constanza in his paper published in 1997, he estimated that to be around uh, 33 trillion US dollars, which is much, much higher than any country's GDP. Uh, and now uh, in uh, 2014, again, he published a uh, latest paper and in which he uh, revised that value to around 127 trillion US dollars. So you can say that these are the amount of the benefits which we are deriving from the ecosystems. Next is the various types of ecosystem services. So basically, we divide the ecosystem services in four parts. First one are the provisioning services and provisioning services are indicating the direct or the tangible benefits which we are deriving from the ecosystems. And this basically include uh, your wood, uh, fuel wood fodder, uh, your, you can say the food, uh, clean water. These are some of the direct benefits which we are getting from the ecosystems, and they are termed under the umbrella of provisioning services. Next, we have uh, the regulating services. These are the benefits which we derive by the regulation of one or more processes of the ecosystems. Uh, so uh, in that, that, we have the climate regulation, the erosion control, the flood control, the disease regulation, uh, the water purification, the air purification. These are all aspects of the uh, benefits which we are deriving from regulation of various ecological processes. Third one are the supporting services and supporting services are indicative uh, of those services which support the generation of other ecosystem services. If supporting services are not there, other ecosystem services won't be there. So supporting services from the name, it is very clear they are supporting the other kinds of uh, ecosystem services or generation of other kinds of ecosystem services. And that's why they are known as the supporting services. For example, soil formation. If soil won't be there, plants won't be there. They can't grow. 
So uh, other ecosystem services won't be there. Similarly, we have the bio geochemical cycles, which result in the uh, cycling of various kinds of plant nutrients, the animal nutrients. So if these uh, uh, services won't be there so other ecosystem services won't be there similarly we have the photosynthesis and the primary production that forms the basis of other ecosystem services also okay so they are clubbed under the terminology of the supporting services and finally we have the cultural services so cultural services are basically uh, you can say that our human culture uh, is interlinked with the nature with the ecosystems so uh, whether we talk about the recreation, for example, you go to various kinds of hill station, uh, national parks, wildlife centuries. So that is basically indicative of the recreation aspect of the nature and the ecosystems. Similarly, aesthetic value. Nature has some aesthetic value. We observe that we are very attracted towards the blue mountains, the grasslands, the green pastures, uh, the forests. So that is basically uh, what that nature has some aesthetic value, which is linked with it, and we are attracted towards it. Uh, similarly, uh, ecosystem uh, uh, and biodiversity, they form part and parcel of our culture, our folk dances, uh, folk songs. Uh, so that is uh, basically indicating the re, uh, cultural aspects and the cultural services and the cultural benefits which we derive from the ecosystems. So all in all, we have the 24 kinds of ecosystem services and these 24 kinds of ecosystem services can be clubbed under four types, provisioning services, regulating services, supporting services and cultural ecosystem services. Next, we come to uh, in detail, we will talk about the provisioning services and as discussed uh, in brief earlier that we have various kinds of food plants. Uh, uh, the plants, uh, they are the main source of the food. Also uh, animals, uh, so for example, the fishes, the cattle, uh, we are also deriving some food products from them. So uh, all of them, they are basically sourced from the ecosystems and uh, they, this is based clubbed under the food provisioning services. Uh, second is the fiber, which, uh, whether we have the cotton, the jute, the silk, the uh, flax, these are all uh, fibers which we ultimately obtain from the ecosystems. Uh, timber, uh, the timber can be derived from the sal, the teak and other kinds of forest trees. Uh, similarly, we have the medicinal plants. So lot many medicinal plants are there uh, and still some of uh, many of them are yet to be discovered and known to the scientific community. An example is there that uh, uh, a plant is there known as periwinkle, also known as Sadabahar uh, in common name. It has commonly grown, it is commonly grown in houses for its beautiful pink color flower. Uh, until recently, the scientific community is not known to uh, the medicinal benefits of this plant and this plant is mainly grown for its, its aesthetic value. Uh, but lately, scientific community uh, came to know that uh, the, there are some anti-cancer anti properties uh, which are found in the roots of this Sadabahar plant or periwinkle plant. So it contains basically the wind crust, uh, crystine and wind blastin, uh, which are used for the treatment of leukemia or the blood cancer in today's time. So a lot many medicine, uh, medicinal plants we derive from the ecosystem. For example, aloe vera is there, tulsi, neem. These are all the medicinal plants uh, which we use commonly at our home. Uh, so this is indicating the provisioning services or provisioning benefits which we derive from the ecosystem. And uh, the next one is the regulating and the cultural services. So in regulating services, uh, uh, the main one are the pollination. Okay. And uh, you know, our food security is all based on the pollination. If pollinators are not there, which in mainly includes your know, honeybees and butterflies and some species of birds also, so, and mammals. And if these pollinators, they are not there, uh, obviously our food security will be under threat. The similar trends can be observed in USA, United States of America, where there's sharp decline in the bee population. And they are very much concerned that how to bring them back. 
because it is not feasible for humans to pollinate each and every flower uh, with hand so hand pollination is only limited so major uh, activity of pollination is uh, caused by the pollinators and the fruits and the vegetables which we derive from our crops they are all result of the pollination activity if they are not there our food security will be under severe threat so pollination is a very important regulating services uh, which we derive from the ecosystem then we have the climate regulation which is an, also an example of regulating service in today's time deforestation is there at the same time we are burning lot many fossil fuels which is liberating the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and there is a build up of greenhouse gases and as a result the global warming it is getting further there is lot many uh, uh, difference in the climate cycle which we observe now as compared to 30 40 years the episode of floods uh, they have become quite common uh, and rampant also in delhi this year we have observed for the first time the temperature going up to 49 degrees centigrade at some weather stations which is record in itself so uh, every time the records are now broken from past 10 years and if this is because uh, the climate regulation aspect uh, of the ecosystem is now breached uh, the uh, plants they absorb the trees they absorb the carbon dioxide they sequester the carbon uh, and the soil along with the oceans they also sequester the carbon so uh, as the anthropogenic activities they are increasing they are uh, interfering with the climate regulation aspect of uh, the ecosystems. So next is uh, pollution control. You all know that green plants, they help in the settling of the various pollutants, uh, which are present in here, especially the dust particles, along with absorption of some toxic gases, which are released by burning of fossil fuels. So that is basically indicating the pollution control aspect of the ecosystems. So if we talk about the cultural services, aesthetic benefits from the picture, you will get a very clear idea that uh, here's a picture with uh, mountains and the flowing water and greenery, you are feeling automatically attracted towards it. So this is basically indicating the aesthetic benefits uh, which we derive from the ecosystem and this is an important cultural service. Uh, similarly, uh, cultural benefits we talk about like our folk songs, uh, for example, of tribal people, they are very much linked, their culture is very much linked to the ecosystem. Uh, even in our homes, we worship various kinds of plants and animals uh, like Tulsi, people, bird, uh, ficus religiosa and ficus bengalensis. Uh, this is all indicative. And even, uh, you have the amla and uh, bail patru. Uh, so th this is basically indicative the cultural aspect of the ecosystem and the cultural services or the cultural benefits which we are deriving from the ecosystems. Now here is a brief overview of the various kinds of ecosystem services. Uh, and here you can say the supporting services lies at the base of all the ecosystem services. They help in generation of all other three types of ecosystem services. So if nutrient cycling, soil formation, primary production won't be there, the other kinds of provisioning, regulating and cultural services won't be there. So uh, in provisioning services, we have the food, the fresh water, wood, fiber and fuel. Uh, in regulating service, we have discussed the climate regulation, the flood regulation. Flood regulation, if we talk about the jungles and uh, your forests, they ba basically act as the giant sponges. Um, you might have observed the sponge. If in the sponge you pour water, it starts absorbing it, okay? And start releasing it slowly and slowly. Similarly, basically your jungles and the forests, uh, the trees which are present in them, they act as giant sponges. And in case of uh, high rainfall episodes, they absorb them, uh, absorb the extra water, which is uh, pouring uh, because of uh, excessive rainfall. And it releases it slowly through the streams which are flowing out of the jungles. So in, uh, in case it helps in the flood regulation, similar effect can be uh, seen uh, in case of wetlands. 
which uh, help in storing the excessive water which inflows during uh, the flood episodes in the river so that that is basically indicating the flood regulation if we talk about the disease regulation aspect of the ecosystem uh, ecosystem is very capable of uh, regulating various kinds of disease and when human beings they interfere with the ecosystem these diseases they become very rampant uh, for example zika virus was once found in uh, the jungles of south america and when uh, it is very restricted to that particular amazonian rainforest and when human beings they interfered uh, with the ecosystem they cut the trees they cause deforestation the the uh, this disease now started affecting the humans the uh, nature plays an integral role in disease regulation also and uh, finally we have the cultural services which we have discussed earlier also that aesthetic spiritual educational recreational aspect uh, are indicated by the cultural services or cultural ecosystem services here is a flow chart which uh, gives you a brief overview that how human well being is integrated with the ecosystem services so basically human well being is dependent upon the security uh, basic material of, of good uh, of life uh, which are required in the life uh, for example your food your shelter and other goods which we use in our day to day life then uh, the health is also an important factor behind the human well being and the good social relationship that means the mutual respect social cohesion and ability to help others so all in all we can say that uh, the ecosystem services they are intricated uh linked with the constituents of uh, the human well being uh, they are very much linked with the uh, human well being so here you can find the various linkages between the ecosystem services and the human well being for example the food is what it is basically the provisioning ecosystem service And then fresh water is also provisioning ecosystem services which is required for uh, the good life these are material goods which are required for our uh, life similarly uh, they are also important for personal security in similarly uh, if we talk about uh, cl climate regulation and disease regulation is important for the health point of view and cultural uh, aspects are equally uh, important for uh, the mental health and good social relation and social cohesion even recreational aspects so here uh, you can see the linkages between the ecosystem services and the human well being now we come to what are the three pillars of sustainability and here we can see that nature has sustained itself uh, through three aspects first one is the solar energy second one is the bio geochemical cycles and third one is the biodiversity if you remove any one of them the nat uh, the balance of the nature it will be Uh, affected and it get disembalanced. Okay, so here you can get the brief overview regarding that. Next, we come to that because of the anthropogenic activities, there is a severe degradation of ecosystem services and there is unsustainable use of these services. So, uh, if we talk about out of twenty. for 15 out of them uh, these ecosystems are used so more than 50% that means 60% of the ecosystem services they are now degraded and uh, that is basically affecting uh, the human well being uh, as the natural asset or the wealth of the country is getting eroded now here is the status of various provisioning services we can say that because of agriculture intensification uh, crops uh, and the agriculture productivity is increasing so that's why we can say that uh, crops and livestock they are increasing but at the same time overfishing is very prevalent and that is affecting the number of fishes in our uh, oceans and seas uh, but at the same time aquaculture that is rearing of the fishes it is basically increasing wild food fruits wild foods uh, they are decreasing because of the de degradation of forests uh, if we talk about uh, the fiber the fuel wood is decreasing because of the deforestation at the rampant range rate uh, similarly if we talk about the genetic resources they are also decreasing and fresh water availability is also severely impacting getting impacted because of the human activities 
here we talk about status of regulating and cultural services how they are Im getting impacted because of the human activities uh, we talk about the pollution episodes they are continuously increasing the deforestation is also increasing and the air quality regulation is getting suffered because of that global warming uh, if we talk about that, so at the regional and the local scale, uh, climate regulation is getting affected because of the deforestation and erosion regulation is also getting affected. Pollin there is a severe threat to pollination as the number of pollinators is decreasing severely all across the world. The pest regulation aspect which includes the various predators, which are natural uh, pest regulators, their number is also decreasing. So if we talk about the cultural services, uh, you can say that uh, spiritual and the cultural values they are also getting affected because the degradation of the ecosystems. And uh, that is with uh, this, I want to end my lecture. And uh, here are the, some references and thank you so much. If you have any kind of question, please feel free to ask me regarding the same about the topic. Please uh, let me know if any questions are there so that I can answer.